Hey guys, got a video here for you that we're going to use to go over the idea of logging events to MySQL or another database. Now, in the event you're writing a web application and you have events occurring within your scripts that you might want to know about at a later date, the best way of capturing that information is to store it in some sort of data store, such as a MySQL table. Now, what we're going to demonstrate today is the general concept and theory of how you would actually capture that information and store it in a table, and I'll show you some sample code for that. Now, disclaimer, the code that I'm going to show you is not very secure because it's early in the semester, and I'm demonstrating how to actually log information not how to actually secure your MySQL queries and protect them against uh, SQL injection attacks. In fact, the HTML form that I'm going to show you today is vulnerable to HTML injection attacks, so it should not be used as an example either. Okay, so let's dive right in. Let's say you've got a web page and you're interested in tracking information about what is occurring on that web page? Who's visiting it? When are they visiting it? What are they doing here? The first thing we'd like to do in order to track that information is to look at what information is available to us. So I've created a web page here that will actually show you the information that's available to PHP at runtime. So first off, I've got the date time formatted in a variety of ways, and I'll talk more about that. I've got the dollar sign server super global. I've also got the get, post, cookie, and session super globals being displayed on the screen here. So let's see what this code looks like when you execute it in the browser. So here we've got the time, and you'll notice if I refresh the page, the time changes. And time by default is represented as the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. Uh, however, we don't want the information stored that way. It's best to format it in what's called the ISO 8601 standard. The 8601 basically says it should be year, month, day, hour, minute, second, and time zone. And it uses a T right here in the middle to represent the beginning of the time portion. So here we can use the uh, manual formatting that I've entered in. And if we look at that code real quick, I'm just entering in the year, month, day string. And the uh, letter T is escaped, so it'll just show up as T. And then the hours, minutes, and seconds. And then I've got the letter Z on the end. That basically hard codes the letter Z right into it. Uh, not necessarily the best approach, but I know in this script it's always going to be UTC time, so it's always going to be Z or what we call Zulu time at the end of it. The uh, PHP language actually has what's called the Atom format built into it, and you can just type date and then in parentheses backslash date time colon colon Atom, and that will actually render it out in mostly the same format. The only difference is that when you look at it, Zulu time is actually plus zero minutes and seconds. So same representation, uh, slightly different format. And then lastly, we have a MySQL format, which is simply year, month, day, space, hour, minute, second. So we've got the date time formatted. We've got the dollar sign underscore server values. And there are quite a few values that are available here. So first off, we might want to know what the IP address of the host is. This is very useful in case that you have uh, more than one web server. You have a cluster or some situation where you're logging multiple servers into the same database. So having the actual IP address of which server was accessed is very interesting. Also, the user agent string. That is a string of characters sent by the browser to tell you a little bit about what client is accessing the website. So here you can see it's Mozilla uh, 5.0, Windows NT 10, 64-bit, so on and so on, and it's basically Firefox. Now, if I were to switch over to Chrome, 
you would get mostly the same information here, but you'll notice that instead of Firefox, it says Chrome and Safari here at the end. So uh, just a little difference to realize that each browser may have its own values there. So we come back to Firefox and we look at what we've got here. We've got other pieces of information that might be interesting to us. For example, we might want to know what uh, script was being executed. We might want to know what method, such as post, get, put, or delete, was accessed. We might also want, instead of the full path name of the script, just the URI that was being accessed up in the URL portion of the browser. So scrolling down a little further, you'll notice we don't have any information in the get, post, cookies, or session arrays. So really what we have available is what's up here. So now that we know a little bit about what we can capture, let's talk about what I've chosen to capture in my database table. And this is going to vary depending on whatever you, your needs are and whatever you choose to capture. But this is pretty much a full, robust set of information that I've chosen. So I've created a database table uh, in my database. Um, here you'll see I've got several fields to track what's going on. First off, I give every event an ID in my events table. That way I can go back and identify a particular event to uh, update or delete or whatever. Um, that's an auto increment field. I've also got a severity field. The severity defaults to zero, which means it's just informational. Um, in my mind, the larger the number that you put into severity, the more important that is from a security standpoint. So for example, if something's kind of fishy, I might give it a one. If something's really concerning, I'd probably go with a two. If I've definitely identified a attempt at a hack, I may make it a three or four or five. Now the description is just a description of what the event that I captured is. So maybe the page was loaded, so I put in page load as the description of the event. Or maybe somebody tried to SQL injection attack my server, so the description might be SQL injection attack. This description should just be some common value that you can search on later so that no matter what page the SQL injection attack occurred on, you'll get all the records for SQL injection attacks. Uh, we want when the event occurred as a date time. I'm storing that user agent that I showed you. Obviously, I want to capture the remote IP address of who attempted this hack or who um, triggered the event. Here's the host IP address so we can tell one server from another. What page was being accessed, index.php, post.php, add.php, and so on. What method was utilized? get, post, put, delete, so on. And then lastly, I have an extra info field. This is just where I throw in any information that's very specific to this event. So I can put in there information such as what the actual text was of their SQL injection attack or what the text was of their HTML injection attack. Okay, so now that I have that outlined as far as what my table looks like, Let's look at some code for inserting into the table. So I've created a function and I've placed it inside a functions.php file. And this function is called log event. The purpose of this is to be able to include or require this particular PHP code into any of my web pages. And I don't have to rewrite all this code every time. So the function itself takes a description as input, the extra info I talked about, and the severity. And you can see that I'm defaulting extra info to null if you don't provide it, and the severity to zero if you don't provide it. So the first thing we do is we connect to the database, and I've hidden that because my username and password is embedded in here. Again, not using good security practices for this example. Next, I gather all the values that I can from the actual request. And in this case, it's when the event occurred, the user agent string, the remote IP and host IP, the URI and the request method. 
I then perform a uh, insert into the events table. And again, this is not a good example of how to write a secure uh, SQL query, but we're using it early in the semester, so we'll find out more about how to improve this. So we create the SQL string, we prepare the SQL string, and we execute it. Lastly, if there's a problem, I'm just going to ignore it because I don't want to end up crashing my application just because I'm trying to log a message later on. Now, if I did actually have problems, I could come in here and uncomment my var dump and find out what's occurring. So I've got this function written, and I'm going to include this functions.php file in my page. And I do that by doing a require once for functions.php right at the top of my post page. That would be this page that we're playing around with right here. And the first thing I'm going to do is just log an event. Page is accessed. So I come in here and um, go to my page. If I load the page, then it should call the function passing in page accessed, which should create a record in the table. So if we come back over here and we browse the table, we find that indeed there is a record stating that the page was accessed, the user agent, my IP address, the host IP, and so on. Notice the severity defaulted to zero, and there's no extra info here. So if I come back over to my code, I see that this code has worked properly. Now, what happens if they decide to submit something in this text box? So what I'll do is I'll capture this dollar sign message variable only if there's a post request method. Otherwise, message stays as blank. So if they're posting, then I want to grab the message out of the post super global. I'll log an event saying, just like page was accessed, in this case, I'll put in input received. And as extra info, I'll include the message. So let's go take a look at what that does. So if I type in buy and submit, it displays my message by, and it should now have two more records. One saying the page was accessed, and one saying that input was received. In this case, the severity is still zero, but now we see the input that they actually typed in here. So far, so good. We've declared a message, we've logged it in the event that they typed something in, now, what happens if they send a post request that involves HTML characters? And it looks like they're trying to do an HTML injection. Well, a really low tech method, which is only partially reliable, would be to look in the message for a less than or greater than sign or some HTML character. So we're gonna say that if we find a less than sign in the message, we're gonna log an event. Maybe there was an HTML injection attack. We're going to include the message, which is what they entered in, and we're going to up the severity from zero to one. So let's go back to the web page and let's try putting in here a simple HTML injection where we're putting in H1 tags around our message. If we submit it, notice we successfully injected HTML into the web page, which means this page is vulnerable to an HTML injection and look at what happens in the database. So now we have three more rows. The page was accessed, the input was received, but this time we logged an HTML injection attempt. We gave it a severity of one and we logged what that information was. Now, this is a very simple example of how, if we're operating a web application, we can look for events that are of interest, we can capture those events and we can store them in a SQL database. So that means anytime we have a particular page of interest, we're going to bring in our functions and use this log event function we've written to either just log interesting events or log interesting events with extra info or maybe log an event that actually concerns us because this might be 
uh, an attack or something that we want to keep track of.